welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook network. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that like. Give a high five to the subscribe and come and join us in the chat. This is an interactive episode of the show. We already have a lot of great questions that we're going to get to. Some of you even took the suggestion that, yes, you can come in before the show goes live, drop a question, and we'll be able to see it. Heck, we might even start brainstorming our answer for it. And you don't even have to stick around. You can come back and get it later. So that this is always an opportunity, especially with these Thursday episodes. Uh, we will be getting into some questions from the big old bag of mail. You leave us a five-star review. You put your question in that review. Uh, we will get it to it in a future mailbag episode. But again, these live audience questions – Come and drop them in early. That's the best chance to get them on the show. Questions today from the big old bag of mail, including uh, looking at the new starting quarterbacks for a lot of prominent teams. Uh, some conference realignment questions, as there always is around this time of year. But I want to begin with just a, a small little bit of news, at least as we continue to track these rule change proposals that we've discussed here on the uh, Cover 3 podcast, as ACC Commissioner Jim Phillips had a conversation with Heather Dinich. The ACC is holding its women's basketball tournament currently in Greensboro, some media availability for the commission right there. And he has indicated to ESPN that, that there is great support across all the FBS commissioners for some of these rule changes. The rule changes included the running clock after a first down, except in the last two minutes of each half, eliminating the option for teams to call consecutive team timeouts, a.k.a. getting rid of icing the kicker. Uh, and if there is a dead ball foul on the defense, we're not going to do an untimed down. All of this is with the idea of uh, shortening the game length. So, is that do you think that this is all rubber stamped here? We we should be looking at seeing these changes uh potentially as soon as this coming 2023 season. Uh, yeah, probably. I think kind of like what we talked about the when we first brought it up, the three rules that aren't ridiculously stupid, I think have been kind of rubber stamped from the beginning. The fourth one was kind of a diversion, red herring kind of feel, and it was just like you know, it was a what like a trial balloon floating it out there just to make sure nobody like rioted and destroyed everything and then okay cool because i mean if, if he's coming out and saying every other commissioner's on board with it i feel like it's going to happen what's the big 10 commissioner think uh i was talking to him this morning <laughs> he said tom whatever you think is best for the league is what we're gonna do because you're the right. we were we were we were just yapping before the show came on. I think it's kind of wild that's just been very quiet on that front. Just you know, commissioner. Oh, was that the Big Ten commissioner talking to ESPN's Heather Dennis? Oh no, the ACC commissioner. Sorry, oh, I didn't miss that. Right. Hey, hey. Um, no, I think you nailed it. I think you're exactly right. I think the most interesting thing that I saw from from um, Phillips' comments is that it is expected to go into into play in 23. Like no. You know, there's some teams that have already, you know, almost halfway through spring football, they're going to be done in two weeks. Like they don't get a chance to practice it really in the spring, which isn't that big of a deal. And I also think, much like you guys said, I, I it they made sense. It's common sense. I think it's a pretty easy fix. I do think it's. I know they keep going to the uh, the safety issue, but I think the bigger impact is going to be time. Like I, I and that's why they floated because if they would have gone running clock after incompletions until they had you know the ball set, it starts running. That to me would have been a real shakeup to the system, and you're seeing a dramatically different and a big time adjustment for the teams to get used to. And it'll still be adjustment to get it you know with the clock rolling after first downs. But I think they can easily roll this out there, see what impact it has, and if it's not an imp enough impact as they feel it is. The next cycle, they can go ahead and, and bump it up and add the fourth, you know, model that they wanted to use, which was, um, you know, to to set the ball and start the clock right away after incompletes. Yeah, I, I think you're right in that it's not safety. It is time of game because this, to me, my suspicion is this the, the idea that we want to, you know, speed up the game is just another sign that the television networks are kind of running the sport now, like realignment, all of this stuff. It's all to make it a more palatable television product for the networks to fit more games in on a Saturday without run over having to bump games to like ESPN news or whatever. So yeah, I, I do think it's going to happen. Yeah. So uh, I'm wondering, you know, it's I'm, funny because 
I, I think we complain about late games. Most of the fans that you interact with, they're like, who cares? We love college football. We don't want less. We want more. So we're going to get shortened games. Although I don't think people are going to complain about three hour and 15 minute games. I no. guess I think it is good. And if you're looking out long term and if you're looking at caring about the fan that brings his family and his kids get tired, if you go to an eight o'clock kick, like I, I think it is a smart thing to do just overall in general. But I also think what you said was very astute observation was that the TV networks are involved. Because I don't I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference as far as the number of plays run. Seven no. to eight plays per game is the estimation right now from the experts. The entire and, game over the season. And yeah, and then uh, right. they are also saying about 10 minutes off of like the average game time. The difference won't be too dramatic, but the games that run long – are the kind of games that if they're fun the was running <laughs> after first downs would be moving faster. Like the, you know what? We don't have a problem with the game time army Navy. That thing is done in <laughs> two fifty four. forget under three and a half hours. We are under three hours uh, with army Navy a lot of the time. And so, you know, the, the, the game time will be more impacted with the games that go longer. I don't think that the game time is going to be impacted by these games that have always been nice, crispy, 315, 310. Probably not going to be that dramatic. They will be very dramatic when we get to a lot more of these uh, dink and dunk type offenses with a lot of first downs and a lot of stoppage of the clock. And if we just look like Danny, what you were saying, not many fans are really complaining about the length of the games. It's mostly the media who complains about the length of the games. But like even to me, like you look at what's going on in baseball right now. My problem with baseball the last few years hasn't been the length of the games as much as it's just been the amount of nothing that happens because it's all just, you know, walk, strike out, home run. There's just not enough action going on. I didn't care that it was taking three hours and 15 minutes. That said, these two and a half hour games, no complaints. I mean, it's like I don't mind a shorter game. Um I would like uh, centralized replay, and I would like if you want to shave some time off of a broadcast to enhance the fan value. I I don't know if centralized replay is actually the right suggestion there, but I would circle timer, that. Yeah. Timer clock, like we have the pitch clock in baseball. If you can't tell conclusively, ninety seconds. Like get, you can look at as many replays as you need in ninety seconds, and if it's not obvious. The call stands, and if it is, you turn it over and you move on. Like, and if it's not, like, and if, and again, I love the XFL transparency stuff where you just you listen in and you get to see see what they're looking at, hear what they're saying. I think you'd avoid a lot of controversy because if you heard them saying, "eh, I don't know, I don't see enough from this angle," let's look at this one. I don't see enough. Up, uh, can't overturn it. Bam, and you roll. Fans are oftentimes swayed by the analyst and the official mm-hmm. analyst who's in the booth who starts his opinion and starts talking out loud. And then all of a sudden it's a different call on the field. And every fan's like, Oh, it's rigged. It's rigged. They got the wrong call. I mean, if you just heard the officials, I think it'd be much more like conclusive. And I don't, I think they'd avoid a lot more controversy. And you put a 90 second clock on it. You'd shave off another five minutes. Actually, that's not true. Every single sports fan is an expert at all the rules. They know everything. Just ask them. Uh, this is an, an, an interactive, uh, an interactive show, as we have promised. Uh, this question coming from the chat from Vols Fan 98. If Anthony Richardson and Will Levis are really top 10 ish quarterbacks on just traits, does that mean if Joe Milton has an okay to good season, he's a top 10 pick? He could be, theoretically. It's going to depend on what happens with the rest of next year's quarterback class because right now you look at Caleb Williams, Drake May, these are guys that everybody's considering to be the top quarterbacks in the draft class next year, what teams could be in the market. There's a whole lot of variables, but just if yeah, if you look at the traits, if Joe Milton plays well for Tennessee this year, that arm is rare. And we saw it with Josh Allen. Like Josh Allen was a guy who at Wyoming had a cannon arm and accuracy issues. Joe Milton is a guy with a cannon arm and accuracy issues. You some we've done a better job of being able to tinker with guys and fix it. Now that's, I still think Josh Allen is very much the exception to the rule rather than the rule. But yeah, as long as guys have that, like teams are drafting players based on projections and traits and body types. 
There are it's it's not just the most polished guy that's going to go early in the draft. Teams will take chances on guys because it's that important of a position. And if you hit, bang, Super Bowls. I just he's six five, two forty five. He's physical. <laughs> he's got a cannon. They're going to fall in love with him, especially if he goes to Manning Passing Academy and and you know sucks up to Eli and Peyton and acts like he wants to be a sponge and just teach me everything I can. And his arm pops like and he throws great. Like yeah, it's totally feasible. You could see that. I Did do you think that a bingo card of cliches. <laughs> yes, that's what it was. <laughs> that's what like it was. <laughs> I, I still like. I have to see it to believe it because last year we had Malik Willis as a top ten pick, mm-hmm. but he was not six five. You know, yes. he didn't have Anthony Richardson traits. He had a better year of tape, not his year coming out, but the previous year, he was pretty good. Like, I still wonder if these are guys are going to go as high or they're going to be left disappointed a little bit. And also, of course, it depends on what teams are in the market. Like, yeah, absolutely. If Joe Milton, you know, because I do think you have two really solid candidates to go one and two with Drake May and Caleb Williams, as you mentioned. Yeah. in, In my latest mock that I put out last week, I didn't even have Richardson in the first round. I don't think it's a definite thing that he's going to go in the first. He could go. He might be the first first QB taken off. But like you mentioned, last year, Malik Willis. Oh, this guy's going to be a first-round pick. Look at the traits. Look at the traits. Look at the arm. Look at the you know mobility. And then he didn't go in the third round. I think Anthony Richardson probably would go before then because I think that there are more teams picking early that are kind of in need of a QB this offseason. And I think it's a deeper QB class than last year, which allowed guys to get pushed down further. But I don't think it's a guarantee that he will be a first-round pick. What about Levis? I don't think it's a guarantee he'll be a first round pick. Wow. I th- I, I think that this draft, the more the closer I look at it, Young and Stroud to me, I think are the clear cut gonna be first round picks. Same. After that, it's not as deep as a, as a lot of other value positions that you've typically seen in the draft in recent years. So teams might be more interested in getting the top guys at the more at the other premium positions before they get to the second and third round and you get to the drop off. And especially now with, we don't know what's going to happen with Jalen Carter, Mm -hmm. that position become, that might be even thinner on a lot of teams draft boards right now. So there's a lot of like dominoes that could fall. Pitt med 16 chimed in the chat. He said, thank you, Tom. Finally, some common sense. I agree. Last year really was the first common sense draft though. The trend has been, ah, quarterback, go get them. We got to get them. And quarterbacks get overdrafted. So we'll see if teams use that same discipline they did last year or do they go revert to their old ways, which is more of an NBA model of we'll just get the talent. We see the upside. We're going to go look for the next Josh Allen. What's um, what is your combine schedule looking like, DK? So I travel out tonight, uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, meeting with, you know, interviewing for CBS Sports HQ, Bryce Young and Levis and Richardson and Stetson Bennett. I it's believe the quarterback day get, could get a little uncomfortable with Bennett if he's a fan <laughs> of the cover three pod. <laughs> we'll have to see. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow's the quarterback interview day, and then they throw, I believe, Saturday. Saturday. Yep. They want them in prime time. Give them the weekend. Today's the big boys, right? Yep. Yeah. Linebackers. Eastern. I'll be watching. Did you see Jalen Carter is back? He went, well, he got went and posted and Bond, back. didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And he went back. I mean, that's one way to control the narrative is to say, hey, I want to, you now you can answer all those questions and get out in front of them. Mm-hmm. Or, or not, you can be there to not answer them, right? You can be well, there to say, deflect. like, answering, yeah, answering, the- answering to the teams. He might yes. not be answering to the media. No, he's not going to meet with the media. No. He wants to ask, you know, the Bears are going to sit him down and say, all right, what the heck happened? And he's going to have to give him an answer. And I think our, our Rick Spielman in our first pick podcast, which is Brian Wilson and Rick Spielman, it's a good podcast. If you're into the draft and you care about that kind of stuff, he said, like, depending on Jalen Carter, like, if he told, like, he did the interviews before this stuff came out. Mm-hmm. If Jalen Carter expressed to these teams that this might happen in those interviews, a lot of teams might not hold it against him. If he didn't tell those teams that this could happen or just kind of keep it hidden, that's going to be a big red flag on him for a lot of teams in the draft process. You think? Yeah. I mean, like if, if you he didn't come already in there can't... and say, hey, I got a massive red flag we need to know about. I'm just saying, if you're in charge of, if you're, if from the, from the team side, if that's happening and you know there's a possibility of that happening and you're trying to hide it, what else is this guy going to try to hide from me in the future? There also is a chance that he, I mean, he could say, I didn't know it was coming. 
he could. And that's the play. That's the way I would play it. If that's, that's the way, way I would play it. Yeah. Just, hey, the AJC just broke that article and then the arrest warrant came and I had just learned about it. And and I went home and I went immediately. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can I address uh, one more uh, just on Bryce Young? I forgot. Yeah. It's back a little bit. Uh, Andrew Pace said, what about Bryce Young? His size became a uh, become a big story and issue. Yes, in case you're paying attention, it already has. People have already been dinging him. I think it is such a no-brainer that Bryce Young should be the first quarterback taken, and it kind of goes back to the, like, what risk would you rather take? Would you rather risk a guy that has two years of outstanding film, who has elevated his team, made outstanding play after play after play in the clutch, brought his team back against Auburn in the Iron Bowl, like brought him back against Tennessee, brought him back against Texas. Like the film is outstanding on Bryce Young, but you're worried he could get hurt, even though he really didn't get hurt in his tenure at Alabama except for once, and he came back as soon as he could against Tennessee and played injured pretty well. Or would you rather have a guy that looks durable, but he has not the best film and he's erratic and his trend has been on the field not to make great decisions, not to display great accuracy, but we just hope it'll change and we can coach it out of him. For me, it's a no-brainer. You take Bryce Young, you try to do your best to bulk him up, which I still think is a possibility at his age. Like You could see a maturity in his body that takes place, but today's rules, like and that's I was worried about Tua, not because of his size, because of his injury history. Mm -hmm. Like it to me, it doesn't matter sometimes how big you are. Look at Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz was massive, you know, perfect body, perfect body type. And, you know, he was injured half the time. To me, it's, you know, some guys have a knack for avoiding it. And some guys can take a hit. I mean, he got beat at Tennessee game again. You go watch that. He took some licks and stood right back up. So I would not hesitate for a second to take Bryce Young, number one. Honestly, for me, I it's not it's not the frame so i do think that is a concern but like you're saying the nfl now like you breathe on a quarterback it's a 15 yard penalty they do everything they can to protect them for me it's more his height like you're probably like will he be able to you know it's it sounds silly it's like you know it's the same stuff you had with kyler will he be able to see over the line of scrimmage and see downfield over the middle of the field and that is a real thing because if you look, Kyler is at his best when he's got to improvise and get out of the pocket. So if you do draft Bryce Young, I think you're going to have to implement a lot of that in the offense. But I agree with you too. As far as like the key stuff like poise, accuracy, and just kind of making plays when things break down, I don't think there's a quarterback in this class that comes close to at least having the ability to do that consistently that Bryce Young has had. His sauce is incredible. Yeah, like, the dude is just such a gamer. And I'm glad you mentioned that Tennessee game because that that's the one that people should put on. Where yeah, it's like he's getting kills, he was carrying mm -hmm. that team, and he was getting crushed, and he kept getting up, and and he never looked down. Mm -hmm. You know, like he always just seemed to have like a real good like confidence about him. He was lifting his teammates up. His wide receivers were dropping passes, and he was still hanging in there the entire time. Um, yeah, I, I, I Bryce Young is my one. I d will say. CJ Stroud, I'm not going to think it's a horrible – if a team decides that they favor CJ Stroud and they want to pick CJ Stroud as the first quarterback, I don't think it's a wrong decision. That's probably more of a preference or a risk-averse type choice, right? Right. I would rather take the risk-averse choice with CJ Stroud. If you were looking for somebody more durable, more prototypical size structure – I would take that and say, yeah, maybe he didn't run as nice. But that Georgia game, like, that's enough to sway a lot of people. Mm -hmm. He's a little inconsistent, too. You know, the scheme, they're so much better than everybody. But, I again, I would rather go with that conservative route of at least you know what he can do in that best-case scenario. Like, where was Will Levis's best game or Anthony Richardson's best? Like, I, Anthony Richardson was awesome against Utah they had where he moments. ran all over. Yeah. And he was great in the first half against Florida State. So I, out of Will Levis or Anthony Richardson, I'd probably go with Anthony Richardson because at least I've seen glimpses like flashes of this ceiling, which is way higher, I think, than Levis. Yeah, I think that's the biggest drastic difference when you watch them and break them down. It's like Stri Levis and Richardson both have kind of like wow moments, but you really don't see them putting it together over the course of a full game very often. And that, to me, is significant when it comes to trying to figure out who a guy is and who he's going to be. Well, we talked about Alabama's quarterback, Kentucky's quarterback, Tennessee's quarterback of the future. We got a lot of teams that are going to be breaking in new starting quarterbacks. Who has the most pressure heading into 2023? We'll get into that and more next 
war has descended upon this place. Mark my words, this fight ain't over. Where I'm going is dangerous. Let's look death in the eye then, shall we? What happened? That's all that's happened. 1923. All episodes now streaming exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. What are you holding up, Danny? Did you guys see that? 1923. He's got it ready for the now, flight. Now I told you, see that one episode where it's like, half, mm-hmm. that's the fall asleep one. So I got to get <laughs> that one. That's the one I have, but they're all downloaded. They're all ready to go. Love it. Love it. He when when Danny's back, uh, af, when when Danny c- comes back after next week, you got spring break. Yeah. Spring um, break. After when Danny's back after spring break, he'll have all of 1923 crushed, analyzed, and we'll do a whole mailbag question where Danny gets to break down 1923. 1923 <laughs> reaction pod here on the Cover Three podcast. I uh, do love it. Taking questions from the big old bag of mail. Rem- reminder, leave a five-star review. In that review, put your question. We'll tackle it in a future mailbag episode. This one comes from Tom. Long-time listener and love the pod. Question, parentheses, sorry, kind of long. I'm a, lo- I'm a long-time Penn State fan, and I am very excited about Drew Alar taking over as he is potentially one of the most talented pure passers that Penn State has ever had at quarterback. However, with that hype comes a lot of pressure to bear as the new face of the program and possibly being the one that could get Penn State back over the hump to win the conference and potentially make the playoff, which leads to my question. Penn State is one of several realistic conference contenders that will be replacing their quarterback this season, and as is especially the case with Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, and TCU, some of these teams will be replacing quarterbacks that have been the face of the program for the last two seasons and were highly successful in terms of winning. Of the new quarterbacks for teams that are realistic contenders for their respective conference, who do you think is under the most pressure to succeed in 2023? So I've got there's, uh, there's a long list of them. So I went went through um, our friend uh, Bill Connolly, huge fan of the show and a frequent guest here. His top 25 in the SP SP plus ratings for 2023. I've got 12 and a half new teams with, with teams with new starting quarterbacks. Half of this top 25 will be breaking in new starters: Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, Penn State, Tennessee, Clemson, Notre Dame. Ole Miss question mark. That's my half because Jackson Dart is still there, but we also have Spencer Sanders and Walker Howard coming in there. TCU, Florida, UCLA, Kentucky, Wisconsin. So 13 schools right there that could be having new starting quarterbacks that are all about top 20, top 25, top 30 ish. So who stands out as a, as a quarterback that's under the most pressure? I mean, I feel like there's a lot of good options, but it's got to be the Alabama or Ohio State quarterback. Like, because even at Georgia, like, there's pressure having won two national titles in a row, and you're replacing the quarterback who was the QB for both of those national titles. But the quarterback position is not, might not be the most important position on Georgia based on what we've seen the last year. So it's like, it's kind of a complimentary piece more than it is the guy who drives the car. So, I would say whether it's like Kyle McCord at Ohio State, whoever it's Jalen Milrow, whoever wins the Alabama job, I would say the pressure's on them because you're expected to win the national title every year at those schools, or at least you're you're looked at as a team that can, but it's been a while since you have. Like Alabama didn't even win the SEC last year, win its division, which is the first time that's happened since 2019. So there's already a ton of pressure on Alabama for that. So now you've got to be the guy who might be replacing the number one pick in the draft. And by the way, You've got to win your division, and then you've got to beat the two-time national champion, and you've got to go to the college football playoff and then win that, too. I'll say, love those. Um, That's the exact position I was in, too. We had just come off a national championship. Charlie Ward had just you know, won the Heisman Trophy. I was like, all right, this is your team now. It's like, oh, great. Go get them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, And it is. It is tough. It is like a tough place to be in. I so I had Cade Klubnik as Same. one of mine because you got the offensive coordinator. Like there's not gonna because I think even like Clemson fans, you know, they they didn't love DJ, but he was still a five star and there was still a lot of stress and 
criticism of the offense in general nationally too from guys like us. But now that you got the best offensive coordinator hire in the country and you're the guy and you played really good against North Carolina, not so great in the bowl game, like, but their expectation is going to be, we're right back. We're back, baby. That's Clemson's expectation is our offense is back. We want to see the play that we saw from Trevor Lawrence to Sean Watson, Taj Boyd. Like that's the expectation. Uh, Cade Klubnick was my, the one that stood out the most to me as well. Let me also add that there's not a, a great second option. The rest of that quarterback room is Paul Tyson, a.k.a. Bear Bryant's yep. the fourth, grandson, whatever. <laughs> great, great, great grandson. You know, like the not if Paul Tyson comes in the game, things aren't going well. Chris Vizina, a four star quarterback, is a true freshman. You don't want to throw him out into that situation. I mean, this is a lot that is being put at the feet of Cade Klubnick for a resurgent Clemson offense. And I think that he showed us highs, but he also showed us lows. I mean, remember when DJ got benched and then Cade came in and got real erratic and threw an interception in a really, really bad spot? Like, there's there's a wide variance in terms of the tape of what we've seen. I think Cade Klubnick with Garrett Riley is going to be really successful. From the pressure discussion, I think that that one really stands out in a big way. I want to add one more. This might maybe more of a question because I'm with you. Georgia, there are great options in that room and there is a proven track record of, of that team being so good everywhere else. It sets up the quarterback to be successful. I honestly could say the same thing about Ohio state, considering you still have a Mecca Buka and Marvin Harrison jr. You still got a really, really good running back room. Uh, you've got some offensive line players to replace that were really special, but it's very much um, in a position where you should be able to take this and take it home. Drew Alar is under an immense amount of pressure, as the question, as Tom asked in the question, because he is being looked at in a, in a major way. But is there pressure on Sam Hartman? I know our Notre Dame, our loyal Notre yeah. Dame listeners, <laughs> Sam Hartman going into Notre Dame, sort of looked at as this, this prize transfer portal get. I think there's some pressure on him to be able to uh, at least replicate some of the success that he had at Wake Forest. For sure, but I think like I don't know if I I don't really consider Sam Hartman for this question because he's a returning starter. He's just starting for a different school, but it's it's a different kind of pressure too because I don't know if oh god I'm gonna get hate for this one. I don't consider Notre Dame a title contender. I consider Notre Dame a playoff contender. I don't think Notre Dame's gonna win a national title this year. I think for Sam Hartman, he's going to Notre Dame to prove to people that he's not just a product of Wake Forest offense. So I think there's pressure on him for sure, but I think it's a different kind of pressure to the guys that Alabama, Ohio state Clemson are going to be facing. Fair. Uh, short round put in there. What about Arch Manning when he's named QB one after week one? Uh, Colt McCoy was at the Super Bowl on radio row. And uh, we actually did a whole two-hour show with him. Like, he filled in the whole time, so we were talking to him. And he, like, assisted the Mannings, like, in the recruitment process, was, like, a confidant of theirs. He was, like, because I, I was under the impression, you guys tell me, that Arch Manning was kind of okay with backing up Quinn Ewers for a year, and then, you know, he'd ease his way in. Cole McCoy was, like, I think he's going to start. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yes. He was like, I think he's going to start. Like, he's going to pressure him, and he's going to start. But if if he does start, I don't think there's a lot of pressure on him. You know, of course there's pressure on him because he's manning because it's Texas. But you get – if you're him, you're a freshman, you're going to get some leeway to have that three-interception game where, oh, he's young. But, man, did you see that one throw? Like, I think you get some of that off you. Yes, I mean, yeah. I, pressure's on Quinn Ewers. Yeah, that's what I, I was about I, to say. I was going to have him, but we said new starter, so I want to yeah, make yeah. sure. And we Is, also said national title contenders. No, he said yeah. the question was conference title contender. Texas oh, okay. can contend for a conference title. Yes, they can. Come on. Okay, then that yeah, eliminates yeah. another one. But They can, theoretically, but they really haven't a whole lot lately. <laughs> yeah, despite having the power rating that is seventh best team in the country, uh, something just can't seem to work out. Uh, this night, let's go back to the chat. Um, uh, first off, is it hook and ladder or hook and lateral? <laughs> Second, who are your top three quarterbacks in the Big Ten for next year? It's 
it's hook and lateral because you're running a hook and then you're throwing a lateral or is it is it some teams call it the hook and ladder i'm saying some <laughs> do call it the hook and ladder but i'm saying it's the hook and lateral that's the play. it definitely is it definitely is the hook and lateral but have you have you what? been on a team have you been on a team where you called it the hook and ladder yeah that's been in the playbook yeah. before the yeah. hook and ladder but they might even have like some coaches always have to put their own spin on it so it might be like curl and pitch you know like just mm -hmm. to just to be that guy that can't yeah. do it like everybody else even though you look at it and everybody knows exactly what it is <laughs> that's oh, yeah. a great question though i'm glad he asked it my Shout rookie year i did not ask a question and on the script at practice that i was on the giants my rookie year and dan reeves we had like this one play and it was like 20 double square out and it was just two square outs on the outside but on the script it said double so like shortened but i thought it was double 50 and i did not ask the question so i saw the script and i called 20 double double 50. 50. <laughs> and everybody was like what did you say and i told our our coordinator i'm like look it says double 50 and he's like no it doesn't he says that's double square out and i was like oh but i didn't ask in the meeting when i should have when we were looking at the script my bad so, so there is no dumb question. It's going. It could be either. Could yeah. be either. But hook and lateral, as as the, it is described, it is the hook and lateral. Just some yes. teams call it the uh, the hook and ladder. John says, "Great sub at Firehouse." Um, all right. What about the second part of the question? The top three quarterbacks in the Big Ten heading into 2023. Some of your options, of course, would be JJ McCarthy at Michigan, Kyle McCord at Ohio State, Drew Alar at Penn State, uh, Talia Tagovailoa at Maryland, um, Luke Altmeyer at Illinois, Damn Kate right. McNamara at Iowa, who's uh, or Tanner Mordecai at Wisconsin. Who who would uh, stands out for the top three quarterbacks in the Big Ten? I think JJ McCarthy is the obvious answer because we've actually seen it and michigan got to the playoff last year with jj mccarthy but we haven't seen mccord we haven't seen alar talia i think if you want to just go with production should definitely be in the discussion but like when you look through the conference there's not a ton of guys that are proven in the league this year like it's going to be really interesting to see like you could you could assume kyle mccord's probably going to be good because he plays for ohio state in that offense and they typically produce good quarterbacks Drew Alar, I think, is good. We'll see. You got to see it to believe it first. And it's just, yeah, I think you could honestly make, based on having what you've seen, if you wanted to say J.J. McCarthy, Talia, and Cade McNamara were the three best quarterbacks in the Big Ten that you know right now, it's not a completely indefensible argument. So I'll just go with that. But you're saying, so you're saying all your, you're not predict, predicting. No, no but I mean, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to sit here. Know. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and say Cal McCord's one of the three best quarterbacks in the league when I haven't seen him play against a Big Ten team. But we have God, seen Drew Alar in like yeah. very, very small glimpses. Yeah, we saw, him against, we saw him against Purdue last year in the season opener when Sean Clifford went out for a while. He played pretty well. So pretty well. I have high hopes for him, and I have high hopes for McCord. It's just the way I do things. I'd like to see it before I just project it. What if uh, Sean Clifford, what if uh, Alar is like some stud and he's a top 10 pick and Sean Clifford just held at bay, Will Levis and Drew Alar, two top 10 picks and he doesn't get drafted. Like that'll be his legacy. Like I was the guy that they couldn't start over. <laughs> hey, <laughs> might be a reality too. I you know? That's not that far they off. Love Alar. They love him. That's for sure. Uh, I just can't believe you put McNamara in. Like I think we've seen enough to where I'd go ahead and take the risk. Like a Mordecai at Wisconsin with that new offense, like, well, I'm very curious to see how that project unfolds. I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I did look into it after he transferred to Wisconsin. I it, like a very limited sample, but in time against Power Five, I think he's got like a 1.7 to 1 TD to interception ratio. So it's not great. No. Oh, like you, well. Is that a Tanner Mordecai thing or is that an SMU thing? I feel like SMU over the, this is very anecdotal, but over the last couple of years, SMU has been great to beat up on the bad teams in the American and then bump their head on the ceiling a little bit against some of the better teams. Yeah. And they're going to be facing a lot more of the better teams well, or Tanner will be now as a, as a, uh, the quarterback for the Wisconsin. It's, 
Badgers. It's we should not doesn't mean they can't have success because plenty of them have, but we should not overlook the jump in play on a weekly basis moving from a group of five league to a power five league. It's a real thing. Speaking of, uh, this question comes from Robert in the chat. Robert says, mostly for the ACC boys, but Tom can answer too. Thank you, Robert. Tom. Yeah. Uh, if you could replace any ACC school with a current group of five school to improve overall league health, who would you take out and who would that replacement be? Oh. I'll let you guys get yourselves in trouble here. <laughs> All right. We'll let the hate come. I think it's pretty easy who you get. Or who you're of. taking out. Yeah. Yeah. It's Boston College. Yeah. Um, Georgia Tech at that's... least has like tradition. And when Georgia Tech pops, like we've, we have seen Georgia Tech compete for conference championships in this century. And we've seen Georgia Tech in the last 40 years be a prominent national program. Boston College got up to number two in the country that one time in that crazy 2007 year. Yeah, you know, had a couple good seasons. I, I, I go Boston College. I, and then who would you add? Memphis. Really? I was going to say I had two. Coastal or Liberty? <sighs> Liberty's got some money. Like, they're willing to invest. They got deep pockets. You know, it's it's in the footprint right there. Yeah. You know, that one made sense. But I love Boston College and the ACC. They're such a good fit. I really would hate to see them go. Just to make sure we're clear. <laughs> Who else? I mean, like, so you, Syracuse would be on the in in the debate. Yeah, I yeah. Think so. Syracuse and BC, I think, would be the two obvious ones. Yeah, I would. Is that it? BC. Like Pitt's a good like like. I wouldn't kick out Pitt. Wouldn't want them to leave. I, I would get rid of BC Syracuse. because at least, even though it doesn't matter, Syracuse at least does theoretically bring something to the basketball. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like BC's not really even BC's not carrying its weight in much of anything, as far as I can tell. Um, as far as I'd replace with, I'm kind of with you on Memphis. I think that could work. I think that they obviously they care, which would be nice to have. They're trying to win. Um, I I don't know if they'd want in, but I think academically it would fit. And I think it would give you a state that you don't really have. What about Tulane? Mm. I had to, I looked at Tulane. I circled them. That could be a good one. Yeah, that's my my Liberty or Coastal, you know, like those, you're already in Virginia deep. You're already in South Carolina deep. I mean, I, I know that we're not talking about TVs anymore, but just an overall reach. You know, Memphis yeah. has... Memphis has its own history. Like there's so many, all those Metro, remember the old Metro conference, mm -hmm. like all those old Metro teams are starting to work their way into the ACC. They, they follow along that same path. Um, so I'm, I, I, I think that uh, th there would be some options as well, but like Danny said, final point here, we love Boston college. We would never want to see them leave the ACC. We would never kick out a school. That's not very ACC of you. ACC doesn't kick out. We Schools. would rather die than kick somebody <laughs> out. <laughs> By the way, I did. Uh, so we talked to Michael Alford this morning, uh, the mm -hmm. Florida State Athletic Director, and we were talking a lot of ACC, right? Board of Trustees meetings last week rustled, uh, ruffled a, a lot of feathers. I was pretty, I was pretty, I was more optimistic than we were on our last pod. And we're like, the ACC's dead. Like, we just basically were ready to put the nail in the coffin. He really, one thing he did rave about was Jim Phillips. And mm. I was, it was almost like he was making it very clear that this is not anything. The, and he also said the preferences, now well, you can, you don't have to believe him or not, was that Florida State would like to be in the ACC, you know, long term, forever. Um, but he also Four realized minutes. that things need to change. But he raved yeah. about Jim Phillips and the relationship that they have together and his willingness to listen and think outside the box. And I, I just get the hunch that their, their best strategy to survive, and this is for Florida State and probably more aimed at Jim Phillips, is to pressure ESPN to save the conference and to, you know, to rework their deal, 
to figure it out from that perspective so they can be on a level playing field. And if they can't, then that's where the revenue share you know, model gets upended. But I think they, I think they're, I think that's the play for Phillips is to try to go to ESPN and be like, look, my two biggest brands are not happy in Clemson and Florida state. We have to do something. They're pressuring me. I have to come to you or else we could all lose what we've had for the last 30 years. Ah, if I'm ESPN, I just put Florida State in the SEC and move on. The, I mean, there's, that's the <laughs> problem. It's like there's the cynicism of capitalism that says, like, I got a sweet deal. We get, <laughs> we get like all of these schools, 14 and a half on them for pennies on the dollar compared to their market value because they signed this deal back in 2016. Why, why am I going to make it worse for me as a business? Maybe there is something uh, within the, those executive ranks where some, some conversations can be had the, from a business standpoint. And I think we've mentioned this, the only motivation to my eyes that ESPN would have to try and make sure the ACC doesn't die is the knowledge that some of those schools, if the ACC splits up are going to be going to the big 10, which does not have a relationship with ESPN in the future. Like mm -hmm. you would basically, you could move just uh, a Florida State and a Clemson to the SEC and you still keep them within your family of networks. But if Miami or North Carolina or Virginia ends up getting poached by the Big Ten, then you lose that that those prominent uh, brands and those prominent um, you know values. And so that's the only leverage that I could see. But I mean, ESPN does care a little bit about the ACC, considering they're sending college game day to Duke, North Carolina this weekend, and that's basically just a play-in for the play-in game. Duke's uh, fine. Duke's I know. Just, yeah, Duke, Duke is fine. <laughs> Duke's fine. North, North Carolina is not. When I see <laughs> Leaky Black have to make a big bucket to beat Florida State with twenty losses, and they're saying that's a season-saving dunk, I'm like, they're in trouble. Hey, Slightly listen. off topic, but I think you know we get it every year in college football where we talk about everybody sucks. I genuinely think in college basketball this year, everybody sucks and nobody can win the national title. Like everybody's losing all the time in that sport right now. Kansas won't win at all, but they can we, win. They, well, yeah, somebody has to win it. That's the format. I'm just saying every single team I look at when I'm watching college basketball this year, I'm like, oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> they can lose to damn near anybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll do another bracket pool for the cover three. Yeah, for sure. We'll fire that up. Get 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 in touch with uh, the bosses. And of course, we'll pass that along to you so you can come and compete against us. Coming up on the other side, a couple team specific questions, including we got a new look Big 12 in the future. Where does West Virginia stack up against that new look Big 12? And more next. I've been investigating ghost face attacks. He's here in New York. Hello, Gail. Did you miss me? You want to try and finish this? Go ahead. I'm something different. We've got to lure him in. We execute him. Scream. Only in theaters March 10th. Well, that's a franchise that I did not see lasting this long. <laughs> that was out when I was in high school yeah. and it's still going. And Courtney Cox is still in it. Still in it. <laughs> yeah. Now they added Wednesday to the mix. Interesting. Who's what's Wednesday. <laughs> you don't know about Wednesday, the Netflix series. That's the Adams family remake. Oh yeah. The girl from that. I, I don't know her real name. But... That's who that is. I've been seeing her all over. I don't know. I did. It's like, yeah, she's all, she's a hot up and coming uh you know rising star it, it's anyway just like, do we do we need brooding gotcha like yeah <laughs> bro bro brooding with dark features got it nailed <laughs> nailed it all right here back here on the uh the cover three casting special uh here um this next question <laughs> this next question comes from username on apple depressed wvu fan coca is, is this producer coca <laughs> account? we'll see uh, great show to listen to while working with OU in Texas out of the Big 12 in 2024. Is it too much for West Virginia fans to expect to compete for a conference title every couple seasons? 
I understand recruiting is tough for us, but teams like Kansas State and TCU don't have it easy either, and they've still managed much better results. I'm just looking for a reason to care because the Neil Brown era has been a drag, and I think the fan base is beginning to feel apathy. I guess, to summarize, is it still take the check, take the losses without the traditional juggernauts? I just want us to, I just want us to have a home playoff game one time in my life so Morgantown can de devour itself regardless of result. What makes this hard to answer, what makes, honestly, the Big 12 difficult to really figure out at this point with the new teams coming in, once Oklahoma and Texas leave, clearly there's going to be a vacuum. But like when you look at the four teams that are coming in, I'm confident Kansas State will still be Kansas State. I'm confident TCU could still play at a high level where it's competing for the conference. I think Baylor has shown signs in the last decade of being able to be that team. But when I look at UCF, Cincinnati, Houston, and BYU, how many of those four programs would you confidently say West Virginia is better than right now? So if they join the conference, yeah, I think that the conference is wide open enough to where it's not crazy to think West Virginia could have some seasons where it's competing for a conference title. But I, I think it's more likely that you'll probably get pushed down a rung or two. I'd say, who are they the equivalent of? Um, like Mississippi State in the SEC? Yeah. Like you get... Oh, Mississippi Some, State fans are going to be so pissed off. That we're <laughs> but, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, every, you know, you catch lightning in a bottle, you get a veteran class, you find a special quarterback, you can get 10 wins and challenge for the title. But the majority of the times, like a good year is eight, eight wins. You know, anything above that is like a special year. And if you get below six, if you don't go bowling, you're looking for a new coach. West Virginia and Texas Tech occupy the same office space. Yeah. 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 I think that's a good doubt to go on. And they're competing against, like, when they play each other, one of these <laughs> teams is going to have a better season than expected, and the other one's going to be disappointed um, and potentially end up falling to the bottom of the conference. You know, because of the Dana Holgerson connection, remember he, like, the, the leave West Virginia, right as things are starting to get a little hot, you show up at Houston. The Houston, West Virginia is going to be really interesting to see how that shakes out. And Cincinnati under Scott Satterfield. We were talking about you know new um, new starting quarterbacks under pressure earlier in the show. Scott Satterfield's got himself quite a challenge taking that Cincinnati program into Big 12 play where the, the difference, like go talk to Matt Campbell in Iowa State. The difference between being fifth and being dead last in that conference mm -hmm. is like four points a game. So it's uh, it's going to be really interesting to see if West Virginia, again, uh, with Neil Brown here going into 2023, how they're going to end up stacking up against everybody else. By the way, Joe, Joe Corsero in the chat said that Missouri would be a better comp for West Virginia, and I think he's right. Yeah. That's a good one. Missouri. Both Speaking entered new conferences and both kind of occupy the same space in their conference. Mm. Um, let's go... Let's, let's do one more that's kind of similar. This one from Adam. Do you guys think that UTSA could win the American since they have almost everybody coming back and the conference schedule is manageable? I mean... I would have felt better about it before their bowl game. Yeah. You know, like their bowl game, I thought they would play a lot better. I thought they would beat Troy. I don't think I, I like Trailer a lot. I think it's a program with a ton of momentum. I think they're going to need some time, though. They've had some coaching staff yeah, like, turnover that we've talked about. It's going to be interesting to see if they can maintain uh, the same consistency. Just to you still got Trailer, you still got Frank Harris. You know, in terms of the surface level stuff, of course they're still going to be the exact same. But look underneath the hood. There's some stuff that's changing. Some parts that are being replaced. Yeah, I think given what go, what's gone on in that program behind the scenes and the amount of money and effort that's being put into that program, I think in a few years they'll probably be competing for American Athletic Conference titles. I think expecting them to go in there and do it this year, even with Frank Harris back. Because, I mean, like Cincinnati and UCF and Houston are leaving. The current conference champion didn't leave. 
it's still there. Tulane is still there. Memphis has been a good program. ECU was a good program. So it's, I think that's kind of a large step up to expect that they're just going to walk into the American and start beating up on those teams. Yeah. Conference mostly. USA is weak. Yes. Like that's the other issue. Oh, oh, you mean you mean Liberty's the Liberty Invitational? <laughs> yes. Like from they 20... better own it. They I think Conference, I think Conference USA is uh, is fascinating, and I'm very excited to look at. I mean, we got Rich Rod coming in. Jacksonville State's an FBS program. Um, Liberty hey, joining Conference USA. We, we, we love, need to. We love Conference USA around here, baby. <laughs> we need to do CBS that. Sports Network special. We, we need love to put it. on the budget an episode for like this summer to kind of go over all the new conferences and the schools. We need it. I need it. I yeah, need for me, we'll we'll <laughs> present it. We will present it as for our listeners and viewers. But the reality is for us, we need to go over it and have a study session because it's like you just mentioned Jacksonville State's a conference. You're saying I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, if if you don't think that our summer podcasts are as much for us as they are for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, get 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 all those uh, opinions dialed in in June and July, then August is a breeze. It's always what I say. All right, well, one last question. This one from the five-star, uh, big, the big old bag of mail, five-star review. Uh, it comes from Mintz. Love the show and excited to hear more Barton next season after more Vanderbilt SEC wins. Uh, as of now, the Pac-12 has not signed a TV deal, and each day that passes, the remaining schools are more and more vulnerable. You three have been hired as the Big Ten commissioner. Why not grab Oregon and Washington at a discount and give them half shares until the next TV deal? They would then become full members when the new deal is up. Would you be able to convince the Big Ten presidents to make that offer, and would both schools take that deal? For precedence, I do believe that th there has been the practice of in the conference realignment shakeups. Sometimes you are not getting your full share mm -hmm. of the media rights payout for a year, a couple years, and it takes some time to be able to build that up. So that's not a entirely novel concept that is being pitched here in the question. Yeah, like the, if, if if Oregon and Washington got like a half share in the Big Ten, it might be more than they would get from the new Pac-12 TV deal. So, um. I would very much consider it, yeah. But I also want to make sure that I'm getting because I did just sign the new TV deal. I would need reassurances from my network partners that adding Oregon and Washington increases my deal enough to justify. <laughs> Even if I'm only giving them half shares, that means I'm taking money out of everybody else's pocket. Right. So I need to make sure it's enough to cover that first. But yeah, because I, I think in the long term that's going to be the plan. They need to. They can't force USC and UCLA to be flying over the Rocky Mountains. Although that said. It's not like the trip from L.A. to Eugene or Seattle is a short trip. Is it safe to say, though, that Oregon and Washington would jump at that deal? Oregon and Washington would jump. I think that the interesting side of this is a Big Ten president at Minnesota. Why, why, why am I signing up to make less money and pay out them mm -hmm. just to throw them a lifeline right now? That's one side of conference realignment. We sit around and we, we try to peg all these teams. Oh, then you go grab them. You got to go grab them. These all have to be voted on and approved by schools that are now having to bring somebody else to the table and share the pie a little bit more. And I I don't know. I thought it was an interesting way to present it. Would the Big Ten presidents take that offer of a half share for Oregon and Washington, a little bit less money, hoping to be able to make it up on the other end with your global domination college park to Seattle conference? I don't know. I, again, like, I, I think I think that would be the key. You have to make sure that you're getting more money for everybody and not taking from what the current deal that everybody just agreed to is because that would be a hard sell. For me, the more important thing right now is what is this Pac-12 television deal going to look like? Because, gosh, it's not going to be pretty. No, and like I mean, let's be honest. Like they didn't hire somebody to run the conference who had experience running college athletic conferences. They ran somebody from the entertainment kind of background specifically to get the television deal and if you don't get the tv deal that you wanted i just it's i think there's a yeah it's it's not great yeah oregon and washington would jump would the big 10 go through this we'll see uh very interesting to continue to follow we will be back on monday 11 a.m eastern time putting on our draft pants 
talk a little combine, big headlines, players that stood out. Anything that we were surprised, anything that stood out to us, uh, we will be sure to hit that and much more of the news. Watch Danny Cannell on CBS Sports HQ. He will be with uh, the quarterbacks on Friday and helping us with all of our coverage from the combine in Indianapolis. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernell. You can follow him at Danny Cannell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Made it a whole episode. Yes. Yeah.